Hello and welcome to week four, part four of EGM 703, Applications of INSAR. In this lesson, we'll learn about a number of different scientific applications of INSAR. One of the main applications of INSAR for topographic mapping is not something that we're going to cover here. Instead, we'll focus on applications that look at monitoring deformation or surface motion due to different causes including groundwater depletion, volcanology, earthquakes, landslides, and glaciers. Pumping groundwater out of or into underground aquifers for different uses can actually cause the ground to move up and down. In some cases, this actually obscures the seismic signal that's visible in the INSAR deformation. This study from 2001 shows the seasonal elevation change in, a, in Los Angeles as a result of groundwater pumping and replenishment using a series of ERS images. In the top interferograms, we see patterns of basin uplift up to 34 millimeters in the satellite's line of sight during the fall and winter months. And in the bottom two, we see basin subsidence of up to 60 millimeters during the summer months. The changes, here, the changes observed here are very small, less than a decimeter uh, over a particular period of time, but differential INSAR is sensitive to these small changes and we're able to actually observe this ground motion. When magma moves in the plumbing beneath a volcano, it causes ground deformation. That can be measured using differential INSAR techniques. These movements can potentially be indicative of interruptions, so INSAR is an important component of monitoring volcanic activity. When we observe motion using INSAR, for example shown here in the interferograms on the left side of this figure, we can use inverse models to infer the source mechanism and characteristics that led to the observed deformation. These are the clean interferograms on the right that show the best fit model parameters that produced the simulated interferogram shown. There are a few example studies shown on this slide and included in the links at the end of this lesson. On the top here, we see an example of an INSAR study of the earthquake swarm that occurred at Akatan Volcano in the Aleutian Islands, Alaska in 1996. Over 3,000 earthquakes were observed using temporary seismic stations on the island. Though individually small, the cumulative effects of these earthquakes was approximately equivalent to a single magnitude 6 earthquake. Despite the number of cumulative, the, despite the cumulative power of these earthquakes, the deformation associated with the swarm did not end up leading to an eruption, at least not yet. The second example comes from a 1995 study by Massonet et al that demonstrated the ability of ERS INSAR data to observe the deformation that was caused during an, during an eruption of Etna Volcano, Italy, which lasted from 1991 to 1993. As we discussed in the lesson about the principles of INSAR, we need to be mindful of the potential limitations of INSAR, especially when it comes to atmospheric effects. As we've seen, Atmospheric delays lead to a change in the phase measured by the sensor, either due to variations in humidity, temperature, or pressure, or related to elevation as a result of vertical stratification in the atmosphere. If we don't properly account for and correct these effects, our analysis can lead to incorrect interpretations. In this case, a 2020 study claimed to see a precursor deflation event shown here in the red dots, before a fatal 2019 eruption at Fakari or White Island volcano in New Zealand. The analysis of the INSAR data in that study, though, did not properly take into account the atmospheric delays caused by the variations in humidity, temperature, pressure, etc. Once those uh, once those delays are corrected, the inferred deflation event all but disappears from the INSAR time series, shown by the white circles here. As we've seen, earthquakes, especially large ones, result in a displacement of the Earth's surface. An example of this that we'll see in this week's practical is the magnitude 7.1 earthquake that occurred on 6 July 2019 near Ridgecrest, California. 
This data set, which contains a number of Sentinel-1 interferograms processed by HYPE, highlights how we can see the displacement using INSAR. We can clearly see in the after image, we can clearly see the circular fringe pattern using an INSAR pair that comes from before and after the earthquake. The two sides of this pattern are effectively reflected across the fault where the displacement occurred. Not only can we see the surface displacement, but we can also use the change in coherence to potentially map damage to structures in the affected area, especially if we use cross-polarized signals. The study shown here use two pairs of images, the first from before the earthquake and the second from before and after the earthquake, or the interseismic stage. And the example here highlights areas that had a large change in coherence before and after the earthquake compared to field-checked maps of structural damage. The areas where we see large changes in coherence are also the areas where we see damage to structures. A landslide is a gravity-driven ground movement that occurs due to an instability in the material, for example, in soil or gravel or rocks. And the example here shows what one type of landslide looks like. So we have a scarp area up at the top where the slope has actually moved down. We have a debris flow where the material has created or gone through a channel, and an accumulation area where the material has actually built up after having moved down from further up the slope. Using INSAR, we can actually observe these displacement patterns or these deformation patterns. For example, here we clearly see the accumulation zone in the displacement map represented by a shortening of the line of sight distance between the sensor and the slope. To study landslides, we can use ground-based sensors as was used in this study referenced here. Uh, this example image, uh, the Gamma Portable Radar Interferometer, has a transmitting and a receiving antenna that rotates and scans in order to create an image. We can also use satellite-based sensors, as shown here. We have a number of landslides visible in this interferogram outlined by the dotted circles. Now, This is an example where the signal coherence, and therefore our ability to detect these landslides, depends on the wavelength of the sensor. So if we switch from the L-band radar shown on the left to the C-band radar shown on the right, we see that we lose coherence and have a much harder time picking out the ground motion, even when we already know where it is. So we've seen examples of how we use SAR data to measure glacier motion. We know that INSAR only gives us deformation or motion in the sensor's line of sight. As covered in the previous lesson, if we want the full two- or three-dimensional displacement field, then we need a combination of ascending and descending passes. We also need an accurate DEM in order to be able to geocode the results. One example of a study using these techniques to observe glacier motion is for a surge of Monocobrian, Svalbard, which occurred from around 1991 to 1998. A glacier surge is a periodic increase of glacier speed. During a surge, the glacier velocity can increase by 10 to even 100 times above the background values. However, that faster surface motion creates crevasses which break up the surface and cause a loss of coherence, meaning that INSAR is not really a suitable technique for observing the fastest moving parts of the glacier, as we can see in the maps here. The lower parts of the glacier don't really have usable results, and the INSAR observations are mostly limited to the upper portions of the glacier. Again, as we discussed in the previous lesson, the INSAR signal contains phase differences that arise to deformation, topography, but also orbital errors, atmospheric delays, and noise. To help in studies of deformation using INSAR time series, we often want to focus on locations where the signal is both strong and constant and the noise is minimal. We call these locations persistent scatterers. We can further divide these into two different types. Permanent scatterers, where the radar response is dominated by a strong reflecting object and is constant over time. 
and distributed scatterers, where the response is also constant over time, but is due to different small scattering objects. How well we're able to find these scatterers depends on the wavelength. The shorter the wavelength of the signal, the more persistent scatterers we can usually find in an area. For example, in this image, we can see how many more scatterers are identified in the X-band image on top compared to the C-band image on the bottom. Persistent scatterer interferometry is a really useful way to analyze time series of INSAR data, especially in urban environments, because it helps us to minimize the noise that can be present in the data. In this lesson, we've discussed how the Earth's surface deforms or moves for different reasons, on different time scales, and on different spatial scales. As part of that discussion, we've seen a number of examples showing how with INSAR and differential INSAR, we can actually observe this motion, even though it's often small on the scale of centimeters, on large spatial scales from space. As always, I've included links to the different articles referenced in the presentation here. Uh, they're also available on the slide notes, and you can find PDF versions of the articles in the Zotero library. There are also additional papers linked in the Zotero library that weren't covered here, so feel free to browse those as well. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!